good news is you and your family are loved here. The good news is you are not alone here. The good news is you can be real here. The good news is that this church and the people in it are not your hope, but the God who created us is. The good news is what we preach and what we teach. The good news is that God's love, His mercy, His grace, and His forgiveness is specifically for you. The good news is while we're opening these doors and inviting you to belong, to belong to a community where you and your family can flourish in the life God intended for you to live, to be restored, to encourage others, to discover the mysteries of God that are hidden in Christ. Join us. Well, good morning, you flourish. Good to be with you. Pastor Kurt, thank you so much for allowing me the privilege to share this place with you today. Uh, I was up early this morning, <clears throat> six, seven o'clock, because all the power is out at our church. So we had to cancel all the services. And they kept calling me over and over and over. I said, stop calling me. I'm at You Flourish today. You guys figure that one out. <laughs> so great to be with you. Great to be together. Before we open up the scriptures, I want to just invite you for a moment to just quiet your hearts with me. Can we just take a moment to open our hearts and minds to receive whatever it is that God wants to say to us today? Oh, God, open our ears to hear, open our hearts to receive. May our hands and our feet apply your word to our everyday real life. In the great name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So my wife uh, likes to play this game. Uh, my wife and I have been married for 25 years this last month. So she plays this online game called Wordle. Anybody play Wordle? You know what it is? I don't play it. I have enough irritating things in my life. I don't need that. So my wife plays this online game called Wordle. And my son, who's in middle school, also plays this game. It's basically, you guess a word with some clues. I don't get it because, I, again, I don't, I, don't, I don't need that. But every once in a while, my middle school son will figure out the word before my wife. And then he'll tell her what the word is. And I can promise you, hell hath no fury like a mama who's been told the word of the day by her middle school son before she figures it out. When that happens in my house, I see it going down in the room. I just turn around and walk away. <laughs> App developers and programmers and game makers have making games and apps and toys designed to strengthen the mind. The scriptures, however, have a whole lot more to say about what goes on up here in our head. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Roman church, says this about our mind. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies, our mind is part of our body, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to prove what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. In the, American lang in the English language, we use the word mind and brain interchangeably. And while the two are connected, they actually are two very different things. The, the, the brain is that, that gray mass you know, that sits inside of our skull. But the mind, our mind is the, the energy that's generated by the thinking and feeling and choosing. It's, it's our aliveness. And so when the scriptures talk about our mind and the way our mind is alive in the world, there's a word that's used. A word that's used to describe the proper way of being for a person of faith 
in our world. That word is wisdom. Sometimes the scripture uses the word discernment. I have been, I have been gripped, particularly over the last couple of years, about what it means to be a person of faith living in our world with true God-honoring wisdom. Because we, we have lots of smart people in our world, right? There's a lot of people that are smart, that are intelligent. But sometimes I just wonder, where, where's the wisdom? I said to my wife the other day, and I probably shouldn't have said it because it wasn't real godly and it wasn't real Christian, but I just observed someone doing something, and I just looked at my wife and I said, as a human species, are, are we becoming dumber? Because that's how I feel right now. Where's the wisdom? Film tries to portray wisdom in movies, characters like Gandalf from Lord of the Rings or Dumbledore from Harry Potter or Yoda from Star Wars, Mr. Miyagi from The Karate Kid or Nick Fury from the Marvel movies. All these are personifications of wisdom, but the scriptures themselves reveal a deeper form of wisdom for living all of life. So here's where I want to go for the next couple of minutes. First, I want to look at what Jesus has to say about wisdom. Then I want to turn back to the Old Testament and look at a guy named Solomon who was given one wish, anything he wanted. And then we're going to go back to the New Testament and wrap this up by hearing from James, who was Jesus' brother, because he shows us what wisdom looks like in the lives of people of faith. So let's begin with Jesus. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. This is what Jesus says. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, I don't, I don't like to label people. I don't like when labels are put on me. But it seems as though the Bible, over and over and over, tends to categorize people as wise, foolish, and sometimes evil. Now, most of us, if we're honest, because it's church, right? We try to be honest in church. We can vacillate between being wise and foolish, because some days I'm wise and some days I'm foolish, or so says my wife. (laughs) But generally, we're moving towards one or the other. In the scriptures, Jesus himself describes living with wisdom or leaning towards wisdom as a central part of the Christian faith. Now listen, listen to what Jesus says. Wisdom is not intelligence. Wisdom is in academics. You can be smart. You can have a high GPA. You can can still be foolish. And you can have very little formal education and be incredibly, incredibly wise. I mean, Jesus says, here's wisdom. Here are my words and put them into practice. That's my wisdom. Now, like, I like to watch people. Like, people watching is a pastime of mine. And there are two great places to watch people. The airport and the state fair. Man, you, you ever been to the state fair? <laughs> All kinds of folks come out at the state fair. Like, that's worth the price of the admission, just to go to the state fair and watch people. I love it. You get you a fried Twinkie and sit down and you just watch people for a while. And what it, what it seems, at least to me, as I watch people, emotional reaction has replaced thoughtful response. 
The author T.S. Eliot once said, when there is so much to be known, when there are so many fields of knowledge in which the same words are used with different meanings, when everyone seems to know a great deal about a great many things, it becomes increasingly difficult for anyone to know whether they actually know what they're talking about. And when we do not know, when we do not know enough, we tend to substitute emotions for thoughts. And I suppose if Jesus were here this morning, he would say when we substitute emotions and emotionalism for thoughtfulness, we're using sand as our foundation. When, when I choose, when we choose to scream at each other rather than talk with one another over our differences, we're building our house on the sand. Well, when I'm more concerned what it is that I'm against and what it is I'm afraid of than what Jesus is actually for, I'm building my house on the sand. When I make life-altering decisions impulsively, I'm building my house on the sand. When I choose to use my words, whether in public or on social media, to shame, talk down to others, express my opinions without any filters, no sympathy, no compassion, and no empathy, I'm building my house on the sand. And when I am so convinced of my own rightness and will not listen to any other way of thinking, I'm building my house on the sand. I don't think we need more information. We, we have access to all kinds of information. What I think the world desperately needs is a whole bunch of people who are wise, who hear the words of Jesus and really put them into practice. I mean, really put them into practice. And when you think about what Jesus actually said, trying to put them into practice Jesus said stuff like this. What I want you to do is love your enemy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Jesus, Jesus didn't say anything about tolerance because tolerance doesn't go far enough. Jesus said, love, you have any enemies? I've got a few. And Jesus said, not only am I supposed to love my enemies, but I'm supposed to pray for those who persecute me. You know what the word persecute means? It's someone who is actively doing harm to me. Pray for those who persecute you. Then he said, if you hear my words, you're going to be a person who keeps their word. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. Jesus also said, if someone slaps you in the face, turn the other cheek. Let me tell you something. I grew up in a Sicilian home in New York. Turning the other cheek doesn't come naturally to me. Matter of fact, my dad's Sicilian, my mom is Irish. Not known for turning the other cheek. Jesus said, you want to build your house on the rock? Be generous and merciful. And Jesus himself, Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't judge sinners. He actually invited them over for dinner. See, when you do that, you're building your house on the rock. Now, I want to go back a few thousand years to a man named Solomon. Solomon was the king of Israel. And Solomon was granted something none of us have ever been given. He was granted one wish from God himself. Almost like finding a genie in a lamp. I heard this story about three guys who were in a shipwreck. They were stranded on an island, a desert island, in the middle of the ocean. They were there for days, and one day they're walking across the beach, and one guy trips over something, and they reach down, and they pick up this, this, this odd-looking lamp, and they rubbed it to get the sand off, and a genie came out. It's a true story. And this genie came out, and he looks at him. There's three guys stranded on the island, and the genie says, well, I... I typically grant three wishes, but because there's three of you, each one of you can have one wish. So the first guy says, well, that's easy. I don't want to be on this island anymore. I wish I was back in my office in New York City. Poof, he was gone. Second guy said, well, that's easy. I know what my wish is. I want to be back 
at home in Milwaukee with my family, my wife, my kids. I don't want to be on this island. I want to be off. And I'm gone. Third guy's left and looks around, looks at the genie and says, I, I, I'm lonely on this island. I wish my friends were back here with me. And poof. They... <laughs> Come on, that was funnier than you're laughing. <laughs> First Kings chapter 3, verse 5, for this gets out of hand. That night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. And God said, what do you want? Ask and I will give it to you. I mean, think about that for a minute. The creator of the cosmos says to you, ask anything you want, I'm going to give it to you, whatever you want. And Solomon replied, you showed great and faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued to show this great and faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on the throne. Now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made me king instead of my father, David, but I am like a little child who does not know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted. Give me understanding. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong for who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours. The, great, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom, so God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and you have asked for a long life, you have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart, such as one no one else has ever heard or ever will have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, Riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my decrees and my commands as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Can you just imagine the scene? Solomon, I'm going to give you whatever you want. Just say it. Even if it doesn't exist, it will exist because you speak it. And Solomon says, I, what I want is I want wisdom. God, give me wisdom. And so from that place, King Solomon writes an entire book of the Bible called Proverbs, which is filled with his wisdom. And he begins that book by saying this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Now, now that fear, that word fear is a peculiar word. It doesn't mean like, Terrifying, like if you were to watch a horror movie or go into a haunted house at Halloween. The, the, the word fear means more like profound and awesome respect for something that's beautiful. I grew up in, in Buffalo, New York. And there's three things that Buffalo has going for it, and three things alone. Buffalo Wings, the Buffalo Bills, and Niagara Falls. I've been to Niagara Falls so many times because once you live that close, people always want to go to Niagara Falls. If you've gone to Niagara Falls, then you understand what the word fear means. Because when you stand and look over the rail at Niagara Falls, it is, is powerful. But there's another option for tourists that are willing to pay. There is a boat called the Maid of the Mist that takes you right up to the falls. And when you're on the boat and you can see the water hitting the rocks and the spray and the sound, it is beautiful and terrifying at the same moment. God's creation has the power to awe, but also the power to kill. Ask the dozens of people that tried to go over in a barrel. That's what the word fear means. Beautiful, yet profoundly awe-inspiring and terrifying in its own unique way. And Solomon says wisdom begins there. Wisdom begins with a profound respect for the beauty and holiness and righteousness of God and by hearing his words and put them into practice. So Jesus and Solomon essentially start from the same place. Wisdom is hearing his words and responding. Now in Solomon's writing, there are three themes that emerge. 
throughout the whole book of Proverbs. The first is, is, is the wise choose to seek understanding and not just affirmation for what we already believe. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2. Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. The wise have strong convictions, strong opinions, but can find understanding and empathy even with those they disagree with. In the book, The Wisdom Pattern, the author writes, private feelings are our form of truth today, a kind of ultimate self-absorption, understandably because there are no universal patterns. Yet in expressing private feelings, people really think they've done something great. We see this on talk shows. We realize that those people have never read, never studied, never prayed, or never listened to anybody except their own tyrannical feelings. And yet they think they have the right to air their uninformed opinions. The wise seek understanding. Jesus himself was a generous listener. I mean, Jesus really listened. So when I'm in a conversation with someone, do I generously listen as Jesus did, or do I just write them off because they're a whatever? Or, Or when I'm listening, do I listen to truly hear, or am I listening to form my response to what I'm gonna say because they're wrong? I mean, have I ever actually considered a position other than my own? Because if I can't, then should anyone ever actually listen to me? See, what Jesus talks about is is growth. What Solomon talks about is growth, because with wisdom comes growth. Someone once said you can live with a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset is is simply things will never change. It's just how it is. People don't change. Systems don't change. Society doesn't change. This is how it will always be. This is who I am. It will never change. But a growth mindset says you can change. You can cultivate yourself, yourself and you can change, or you can change society and the world. There are limitless possibilities. See, when, when Solomon asked for wisdom, he asked God to grow his mind. Do you realize that the the very essence of the Christian faith is predicated on the idea that people can change? The Apostle Paul writes, be transformed. Become a different person. The word repent means to change and be transformed, to stretch yourself and to grow. But sometimes it's hard to stretch ourselves because if you're like me, I don't like change. And I can get stuck. And so to get out of my, my stuckness, I, um, I created a bucket list. I mean, I am closing in on 50. I know I don't look that old, thank you, but I'm, I'm closing in. So on my bucket list, I had a bunch of, have a bunch of things. On my bucket list, I always wanted to see Dave Matthews live. I did it, cross that off. On my bucket list, I always wanted to visit the continent of Africa. Got to go twice, checked it off the bucket list, loved it. Wanted to visit India. Did it. Check, check, check that off the bucket list. I still have two more things that I haven't yet completed. The first one is I want to I wanna hike Machu Picchu in Peru someday. And the second one, this, the, the last one was a fantasy I've held for 15 years. And the fantasy was I, I thought someday I'd love to go back to school and get my doctorate degree. Now, you got to understand. you got to understand. I barely graduated from high school. When I say barely graduated from high school, one day my daddy looked me in the eye and he said, you know, I I appreciate America's armed forces. He says, but you better like push-ups because at this point, that's your only option. My dad threatened me with Catholic school. I mean, uh, uh, then I went to college and in college, I had to take a class called study skills because I was on academic probation. I graduated with college, I snuck by. Then I thought, no, I'm going to prove the world wrong, and I'm going I'm to get my master's degree. People told me, Mm-mm. but I'm stubborn. They said, I can't, so I'm going to. 
got my master's degree, and for 15 years, I said, someday I'm going to go back. I'm going to be like Pastor Kurt and get my doctorate degree. Someday. For 15 years, excuse after excuse after excuse. I'm not smart enough. The voice in my head telling me I'm dumb. I'm, stu- I'm not smart. I'm not like those. Finally, I just... So I'm, I'm silencing that. That is a fixed mindset. And last month, I completed my first year of my doctoral program. <laughs> With a 97%. It's not about school. What it's about is a, is a guy who thought he was stupid unintelligent. No, no, no. People can change. Secondly, Solomon reminds us that the wise often pursue guidance. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. The way of the fool seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Wisdom forms when we invite others to speak into our life, even if it's uncomfortable and we don't want to hear it. Three years ago, my wife had an illness. It was pretty severe. My wife was bedridden for six months. For my wife, a victory during this time would have been getting up out of the bed, walking to the end of our driveway and walking back, and that was it. She was, it was, I thought I was going to lose her. It was scary. It was hard. But what made it even more hard is because my wife was ill, I became the mom, the dad, the Uber driver, the homework helper, the cook, which there's all kinds of bad happen when I get in the kitchen. I I did everything. A new appreciation for single parents. I had the whole, I don't know. I was doing everything. And I got two kids and just, and I was starting to kind of get a little mad. Because I'm doing everything. I got dogs. I got all kind, I'm doing everything, and I'm just, I go from being sympathetic to my wife to just getting almost bitter. I'm doing everything. Get up out of the bed. Come on, when does this end? And so I go to our office one day, and I start complaining to one of our pastors. I just need to vent. You ever just need to vent? And I'm just venting. I'm like doing everything, and this is good, and I'm mad. And this pastor generously listens to me. And he looks me in the eye and he says, you know, what if instead of complaining, you served your family as a form of worship? After that, I picked him up off the ground, brushed him off, because that's not what I wanted to hear. But throughout the rest of that day, that was in my head. So that evening, I went home. When I got home, there was dishes Everywhere, because my kids are slobs. Dishes everywhere. And I started doing the, the dishes, and instead of getting upset, I said, God, I'm doing this for you. And I'm going to serve my family as an act of worship. And I, I can't tell you what happened. I, I, don't, I don't understand it. From that moment forward, in an instant, everything changed. It went from a drudgery to being an honor and a privilege to serve my family, all because I listened to someone give me advice I didn't want to hear. Finally, the wise wise are discerning rather than reckless. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 24, Solomon writes, a discerning person keeps wisdom in view, but a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. The word discerning simply means to recognize and respond to the presence of God in the midst of everyday life, believing he's all around. I mean, learning to really see God at work in the world and involving him in your decisions. A belief that the Holy Spirit does guide us. A belief that love is our primary calling. Living with a deep-seated belief that God's actually good and he wants good for us. See, Proverbs also provides a very vivid picture of someone who is foolish and not discerning, one who chooses not to listen. There's this this proverb, Proverbs chapter 26. It's it's one of the most vivid 
pictures you'll ever get. You ready? As a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. Listen, I love dogs. I have two dogs. And as much as I love dogs, dogs can be nasty. You ever seen a dog return to its vomit? That picture is the picture Solomon is using to describe a fool. Let's take another turn and head back to the New Testament. James, the brother of Jesus, answers the question, how do I get wisdom and what does it look like? This is how James begins. This is like profound. You're like, you ready? You've got a pen, write this down. Here's, here's how you get wisdom. Ask God for it. James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. I wonder, are we, are we each day opening ourselves to wisdom saying, God, I want it, just, just give it to me. And I'll know I have it because then Solomon goes on to, James goes on to describe what it looks like. James chapter three, who is wise and understanding among you? Verse 13, let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is pure and peace-loving and considerate and submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, sincere, Peacemakers who sow in peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Now, I don't, I don't like this because I like easy steps. James doesn't give us three easy steps. Do this, this, and this, and you'll be wise. That's what I want, but that's not what we get. We get, ask God for it, and this is what it looks like. Show it by your life. Display wisdom through all that I do. Because a good life speaks for itself. James goes on to say, see, wisdom is, is pure. It loves peace. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 17, Solomon writes, speaking of wisdom, her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. Wisdom is considerate. It's open, not strict. Wisdom is submissive, willing to defer when it doesn't involve strong conviction. Wisdom is full of mercy and loving and empathetic to others. And I, I tell you, we are living in a day when we need mercy. I read this article in the journal Sentinel, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. This is Sunday, April 3rd, 2020. The title of the article on the front page is Why Does Empathy Seem to Be Fading? And the, the author I'm just going to read one paragraph of this article. It begins with a story about a family in Milwaukee who went to Florida for a funeral. After a long day, their bodies heavy with grief, Jody McIntyre and her family dragged themselves into a restaurant in Bradenton, Florida for a 10.30 p.m. dinner. McIntyre, who lives in Madison, had gone to Florida to attend the memorial service for her big brother, John, a local pastor who died September 2nd from COVID-19. My brother's ashes were still in the trunk. That's how raw it was, McIntyre recalled. As the server led the family to their seats, a young man at a nearby table noted the masks they were wearing and muttered, expletive Democrats. McIntyre turned to face him and said, do you know why I'm here? My brother died of covid and the man replied, I don't expletive care. Like, what's wrong, with, what's wrong with the human race? There's a cousin's sub sandwich by our church, and once in a while, if I forget to pack my lunch, because I don't, I'm trying not to eat fast food because i got to lose 15 pounds, according to my doctor. I'll drive up the street to cousins, and I was there this week, and I pulled in just to get a turkey sub, and on the window of the takeout counter, it said, we are short-staffed due to labor shortages. Please be kind to our workers if you have to wait a little longer than normal. And I want to say, like, what, 
Why would that sign need to exist? I want to say to anybody that complains, you got to wait three extra minutes for a sandwich that has more meat in it than people in developing countries eat all week. And you're upset about it? The wise are full of mercy. I mean, do we understand that the Christian worldview is one of the only worldviews that calls us to value others more than we value ourselves? Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. And as a result, wisdom is impartial. It's simple and straightforward, not passive aggressive, doesn't create division, but seeks unity. And it's sincere, it's stable, it's trustworthy, it's transparent. And wisdom always values the art of thinking of reflecting and learning from all experiences, good and bad. So I'm going to wrap this up. When I'm interacting with people, when I'm making decisions, when I'm interacting with someone online, here are some wise questions to ask ourselves. Is what I'm about to do or say loving? Is it necessary? Is it actually true? Is it going to cause regret? Is it going to make a positive difference? Because there's a moment every one of us enter into. It's a moment between stimulus and response. There's a moment between someone saying something or doing something or being something. And then there's our response to it. And in that moment, we choose, am I going to be the wise or am I going to be the fool? Gracious God, my prayer is that we would be a people who choose to live with wisdom. And I know sometimes it's hard. My prayer is, is that we would have grace the grace to live with the wisdom that you speak of so often in the scriptures. Help us, oh God, to be people who hear your words and put them into practice and so we can be like people who built our house on the rock. Thank you, Pastor Mike, uh, for sharing the word um, this morning. Uh, we've uh, had an opportunity, if you, there's anything that you've heard in the sermon that um, you may not have taken that step in giving your life to the Lord, uh, you'll have that opportunity today. Uh, Romans 10 and 9 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, God has raised Jesus from the dead, so you shall be saved. And if there's something you heard today and you want to take that step in salvation, uh, we have Gus and Deanne on our prayer team who's here ready to pray with you this morning. Um, if you just want prayer, if there's some things that you're struggling with in life and you just want prayer, again, Gus and Deanne will be down here uh, to lead you in prayer as we get ready to go into our time of, of giving. So we've had an opportunity to worship in, uh, in music, we have an opportunity to worship in the word of God, and, and now we've come to a portion of service where we can worship in our giving. Uh, here at You Flourish Church, we've got three ways that you can give. Uh, one, you can simply text the dollar amount you wish to give to 84321. Uh, the second way you can give, you can simply go to our website at helpingyouflourish.org, uh, hit the donate button.